Peggy 12. Victoria 3 is a grand strategy game that takes place between the beginning of the Victorian age in the 1830s to the early 20th century. The 19th century saw the expansion of railways, the invention of the telegraph, mighty steamships, new weapons of war, and most importantly, new ways of viewing the world. So I want to start by touching a little bit on the past of the series and what made Victoria 1 and 2 what they are and what made Victoria 2 such a popular game. And I really think it is because the games focus so much on internal management, on the, your population, your economy, and the sense that you're ruling over real people in a real society. What's really important, what sets the franchise apart as a, as a series, uh, is the emphasis on uh, the political and economic management of your country. Uh, and that connection isn't something that we see in any games, to my knowledge. So something that really sets the Victoria games apart from our other titles is that there is a lot of focus inwards, what's happening inside your borders rather than all of what's going on outside of your borders and in relations with other countries. We have the simulation running underneath. You don't have to look at it in detail on a day-by-day -day -day basis, uh, but we aggregate all that information to you. So we show you trends, we show you charts, uh, we show you uh, averages. If you want to drill in and find out exactly what a farmer in uh, Brandenburg uh, working on the wheat farms thinks about uh, the politics of your country. You can do that, but you don't have to do that in order to play the game. There is a lot going on, especially with the pops. There is a huge complex simulation, but we give the player tools to work with that. So for example, the leader of a million plus uh, population country doesn't ask each individual person in the entire population what they want. They interact through parties, through political movements, and through other such collections. And that's what we tried to recreate through the mechanics of Victoria 3. So this lets us have uh, really interesting laws as well that uh, can provide really powerful impact on your population when you do things like pass women's suffrage uh, or even laws that permit women in the workplace. These are new dynamics uh, and new depth to the population system that we didn't have before, and that's really exciting to me to make sure that we actually simulate the world's population uh, and not just a fraction of it. When it comes to the player goals and, you know, what is the aim of a campaign? What are you trying to do? I think this is also where the society building aspects of Victoria really shines true. Because in a lot of games, the goal is more like, I want to take over this territory, I want to restore this empire. But it can be very different than in watch focused games, because instead it can be about, I just want to take this country and I want its people to have a good life. You don't have to have a grand ambition to go first, you can. We always want that, but it can be just as satisfying to just take what's there and build something, build your own little piece of the world just as you want it. So most of our economic model is built on the idea of supply and demand, right? Um, homo economicus. In Victoria 3, that isn't the only way that uh, pop units make their purchase decisions. Uh, we have a good substitution system. So pops have certain needs, uh, like the needs need for luxuries uh, or the need for staple goods. And the goods that they choose is often based on uh, what is most available in, in their market and what is cheapest. Um, but in some cases, entire cultures can become fascinated uh, with certain goods over other goods. So their need for uh, luxurious exotic drinks uh, might favor tea instead of coffee. If you don't provide it to them, they're going to get very upset. Uh, their wealth is going to drop, there's going to be more radicals, and you're going to have to deal with that. So underlying Victoria 3 is this 
very complex economic simulation. And that's what drives the game and even uh, its politics. One thing with Victoria 3 that has been a very stated design goal from the start is that we are not making a war game. We are not making a map painter. We are making a game where war takes a little bit of the back seat. That is not to say that war isn't in the game, of course. It's a historical simulation of the 19th century, and the 19th century was not, unfortunately, entirely peaceful. So war, of course, happens. It can be a way to get things you want, but anything you can get through war, you can also get through diplomacy. Ideally, you should want to try to solve this conflict before it escalates into war. If it does escalate into war, maybe that'll work out well for you, but uh, a lot of your people are gonna die one way or another. It's always best to try to avoid it, if possible. We start the game in 1836, we end in 1936. One thing that was definitely happening there was uh, immense technological change and immense political change. Compared to previous eras in history, life could change rapidly in five to ten years just from the result of a new invention. And that, of course, makes the inward aspects, the aspect of focusing on your people and their lives that much more interesting. The 19th century is also a fantastic era for alternative history because there is so much potential for things to have played out differently, but also because it's the era that shaped our era. I think it's really exciting to get the sense of being able to look into the future of your campaign and imagine a different world right here and right now. Victoria is and should be a deep game with a lot of mechanics and potential complexity. And that's not something we want to change. But we have prioritized accessibility, not in the sense of one streamline or just make the game simpler, but build you know, the interface, the tools and the information that the player needs to be able to grasp and understand and eventually you know, master all of this complexity. As armchair economists and politicians, we can sit and theorize. If this happens, then these knock-on effects would happen, and then society would be shaped this way. This game actually lets you play out uh, and test your theories. So while you have uh, people working in your textile mills, that doesn't just mean like, you know, plus 15 luxury clothes, happiness goes up. No, what it means is that you produce some more luxury clothes, the people buying luxury clothes are the upper strata of your uh, society uh, and their happiness doesn't just go up. What happens is the price of luxury clothes goes down, so their income will stretch higher. Their wealth will go up. They will gain more loyalists in their pop. That means their interest group will become happier and will support your loss more. So by expanding this textile mill, the knock-on effect is that now you might be able to pass a law without the landowners interfering in your affairs. Um, and this is a sort of uh, long-term thinking and, and creative solutions that we really want players to first theorize and then carry out and test the theory and see if there are any additional things that they didn't think about. What really, really excites me is just the opportunity to get the grips with all of these things, the ability to build a complex economic model where everything ties into each other. A game where the politics is not just a sideshow, but so core to the experience of the game, and a game where everything ultimately hooks back and you can look at your society and you can feel the decisions and changes made along the way. I'm just really excited to be a part of this project and the players who have been waiting for Victoria 3 for years and years and years, uh, I really hope that in the end, we will be able to provide you uh, with the armchair economist, armchair politician kind of fantasy uh, that you've been waiting so patiently for. So that was a little bit about the overall vision of Victoria 3. But of course, there's a lot of detail and nuance to all of this and all of the features and mechanics we have in the game. So starting soon, we are going to be covering a lot of these incoming dev diaries. And next up 
is a pretty significant overview of a lot of the basic things in Victoria 3, like pops, how do they work, what are they, and what changes, and what things have me actually made it deeper since the previous Victoria games here. We'll be talking about buildings, capacities, and a whole lot of other things. <laughs>